Hello, everybody. Welcome back to WTF is on my mind. For those of you that are not aware, I do have a Patreon account now. It's patreon.com forward slash Mark Vicente. I would really appreciate your support if you can. It helps me do all the things I'm currently doing and many, many more things I would like to do. Also, if you're on YouTube, please hit the subscribe button and the notification bell. This episode, I'm having a chat with Dr. Glenn Patrick Doyle. He's a clinical psychologist. He's also the board president of an organization called Seek Safely. Dr. Doyle and I first spoke probably during season one of The Vow. We had an amazing conversation. And now many years later, we sat down and had a more extensive conversation about the things that he's doing. I think you'll love this amazing episode. He's an incredible man, and he has a deep understanding of everything that survivors have gone through. Enjoy. Uh, thank you so much for uh, joining us today. Really appreciate it. I know that you have no idea what we're going to talk about. None. None. So let me start by saying that uh, Bonnie and I have loved the things you post on social media, the, the, the short quotes, the yeah. short statements. We've loved them. And I kept on thinking, you know, this guy really gets what it's like. He understands trauma. He understands dissociation. He understands the different coping mechanisms. He understands the, the good days. He understands the shit days. And I thought, I need to talk to him because there's something about what you've been through in your life and, and how you've done your life that you have this kind of understanding. Hmm. So that's the reason I really wanted to talk to you because I feel like of the, 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 the many, many um, clinicians that I've now spoken to, you know, since uh, escaping a cult, which we'll get to, yeah. um, I find that you're one of the people that really gets it on a very deep level. And mm-hmm. it doesn't feel like there's the separation between, you know, the, the, the person going through hell and your perspective as an outsider, because you feel like you're inside, you're inside hell with us. Does that make sense? Sure. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So that's the reason I wanted to talk to you so desperately because, um, and I, you know, just so my audience understands, um, Dr. Doyle reached out to me in, was it 2020? It was when the vow was, vow season one was coming out. Is that correct? Was that when it was? I, I looked back at our, at our first messages and it was, yeah, in 2020 after the first couple, it wasn't even the entire season, but the first couple episodes of the vow had come out. Yeah. Right. Right. And I remember we had an amazing conversation. You honestly, mostly just listened to me because um, <laughs> I think I was, a, <clears throat> I was a rambling mess at that point. <laughs> and I was in a very tender, tender place. Uh, let's say I was just very fucked up at that point. Um, <laughs> but it was an amazing conversation because you asked me a lot of amazing questions and you mostly listened. What I would mm. love to do is just have you introduce yourself to my audience and just a little bit about your, your backstory and your background so they have a, a sense of who you are. And I'd love to get into the nitty gritty with you. You bet. Um, and, and first things first, Mark, it is a... Um, an honor to be talking to you on your podcast. You know, one of the reasons why I reached out to you back in 2020 was because um, the the things that the vow was inviting uh, the world to think about were things that were really resonating with um, the people that I was working with. I mean, they were, they were resonating with my social media audience, obviously, but uh, more than anything, you know, I found patients actually coming in and saying, you, you have to watch this, this docu-series because they are dealing with things that I thought I was alone in dealing with. Right. And the most prominent thing that um, people kept bringing up was this dynamic of, like, like we call it co- coercive control. But um, mm-hmm. at the time, like, no one really knew what to call it. So, well, man, like, uh, like some people had heard the term gaslighting. And, and, you know, like people talk about being in a cult, but for a lot of people that doesn't resonate because like, well, man, I don't, don't think I was in a cult, but man, the things that these people are describing are very similar to, uh, to my experience. Right. Um, and specifically, um, I'm going to take you way back to the beginning days of the vow, that second episode of the vow, um, the, the, mm. the episode title is viscera mm. and, um, it's the episode in which uh, Bonnie 
describes kind of that process of like she was leaving and you guys were like like you and she were having a real process yeah. around that and yeah. you kind of describe boy this is a really tough conflict because here's this woman that I love and 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 I like my marriage right this wasn't a mm -hmm. bad marriage mm -hmm. but here was also this mentor who uh you know man had spent at that point years I think I've been like seven or eight years, mm -hmm. like really working on me. He, he, he had his, uh, you know, he was in my psyche. Yeah. Um, and that conflict just resonated with so many people. Yeah. Um, it resonated with people leaving abusive relationships um, with spouses um, or partners. But more importantly, it, it resonated uh, with people who were leaving relationships with institutions and organizations. Um, so one of the uh, populations that I work a lot with as survivors of a uh, clergy and spiritual abuse. Right. And um, yeah, it, 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 it struck such a chord. So that's why I reached out to you in the first place. So it's an honor to yeah. be talking to you and, and, and I'm, I'm thrilled that you think I might have things to, to offer uh, your audience. Um, you, who you I am. Absolutely do. You absolutely do. Sure. I, so who I am, I'm a psychologist. Um, I'm licensed in uh, Washington, D.C. and Illinois, but I'm also credentialed to do uh, teletherapy work in, in lots of other states. Um, and I specialize in um, the treatment of serious post-traumatic disorders, what we call complex post-traumatic disorders and dissociative disorders. So, so my career has, has really been built around working with people who have had awful things happen to them, but things that uh, the world kind of considers uncommon. Um, and I say the world considers to be uncommon because one thing we know is that they're not as uncommon as the world considers them to be. Um, but the thing about, uh, about trauma, like, like we hear trauma talked about a lot. Like if you go on Instagram and, you know, hashtag trauma, you're going to get lots and lots of content um, from lots of, you know, not just mental health providers. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're coaches and gurus. At, at Seek Safely, we talk a lot about gurus, and you and I can probably have a conversation about what, what a guru is. It's exactly. isn't is not, but um, but now you you hashtag trauma and you'll get lots and lots of content. Um, the world kind of understands or has historically understood trauma to be these these terrible things that happen, but again they're not terribly common. Like one of the things that makes something traumatic, supposedly, is that uh, it, it doesn't happen all the time, so it overwhelms our resources. Um, something that um, we've been learning. And, and, and has really been starting to be written about and understood and kind of publicly discussed, um, you know, really since the 90s, since the 80s and the 90s um, until now, is that uh, there are lots of different types of trauma that we call complex trauma that doesn't fit that mold of like the one time, you know, the terrorist attack right. or, the, or the, you know, the terrible car accident, right? You know, right. complex trauma is the is trauma that that tends to happen over time and it tends to be interwoven into our important relationships and it tends to happen to us in in, in at times of our lives when we are not really empowered to leave or to, to escape right so its experience is inescapable so that's the stuff that um that i tend to to, to specialize in um because what what most often happens or folks find themselves in in treatment for something or other. Right. Oftentimes, it's not for trauma. Like say, okay, I'm I, I'm you know in therapy because I'm desperately depressed and I'm suicidal. I don't really know why. Yeah. Or I'm um, you know I'm, I'm getting addiction treatment, right? Like I'm hopelessly addicted to one thing after the other after the other. I don't know why. And it's usually kind of those routes that people find themselves eventually at the place of like, oh man, maybe there is this worm at the core. And right. maybe there is this underlying thing. So that's the stuff that, uh, that, uh, that I work with. I mean, I, I came to it, um, you know, as, as you alluded to, kind of through my own experience. I often say that, you know, boy, you know, clinicians and coaches and, and, and helpers in, in the world of trauma almost never just woke up one morning and said, you know, what I'd like to think about every day yeah. and I don't have to. Yeah. <laughs> right. It's, it's yeah. complex trauma. No. Right. And everybody, everybody, everybody worth their salt in, in your <laughs> field has an origin story, has you something bet. that, that, that happened. So yeah, I'd love you to share that. Also, by the way, don't forget the, 
the part about you wanting to be a rock star. I do want to hear about that too. <laughs> there is that because that's the thing. Like, yeah, I, I had no great designs to uh, to 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 become a a psychologist. I mean, start at the beginning. So here's the thing that that when I was growing up, um, I didn't know this. I was I was a desperately depressed kid. Um, I mean, I, of course, I knew that I was happy, but I didn't know there was a name for it. And 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 I definitely didn't know that there was kind of a an understood what we call etiology of 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 depression. Um, all I knew is I was I was in terrible pain. Um, and as a teenager, you know, I stumbled across um, self help literature, self help books. Um, you know, I was that I was that kid. I was that. I remember asking for my my, my first self help book was Awaken the or, or was uh, Unlimited Power by Anthony Robbins. I asked for it for my 16th mm. birthday. Mm. And this will just kind of give you a window into kind of how I grew up. You know, I asked my parents, like, you know, so what do you want for your birthday? I want self-help book. Because, of course, I'd seen the late night infomercial, you know, the old, the old Tony mm-hmm. Robbins mm-hmm. infomercials. Mm-hmm. And my parents I say, huh, that's kind of odd. They get me the self-help book and don't ask any more questions. <laughs> right. Like, here's your teenager. Just go ahead and get him the self-help book. <laughs> but let me ask you, how did you go from feeling, recognizing or feeling depression, you know, you know, feeling anxiety to like, I think that's what I need? I didn't know what I needed. Um, mm. I was always really, really interested. And in, um, I, I think you and I have this in common. Like, I was always mm. really interested in, in how the world works. Like so, something I know, Mark, that that you and I do have in common is that we were uh, fascinated by Star Wars yes. as, as as kids. Yes. One of the reasons why that hooked, I think, both of us, is because talking about the Force was one of our first introductions to uh, to metaphysics and to kind of a unifying mm-hmm. theory of of everything. Mm-hmm. So, growing up, I was interested in all sorts of hypotheses about why things might be. Right. So, so it's not so much a matter of like, oh, I need this. It's more a matter of, well, this is another thing. And as I say, like I remember as a God, going back to probably twelve or thirteen years old. I know as I know as about in seventh grade when I saw my first Tony Robbins infomercial late at night, and it wasn't so much like, yeah, that's the thing. It was like, this is another thing. Right. You know, it was so interesting. Right. But the point is, I had no great design to like. Like even after I got immersed in the in the self help literature, um, and and some things are better than others, um, I did find enough things to kind of keep me going because I mean I really was at the point where I was seriously considering ending my life, um, mm. and that for mm. a kid is is really intense but really hard to talk about. Um, yeah, how how old were you at that point? The first time that I specifically remember kind of forming a plan to end my life, as I said, I would guess I was around about 13, like 12 or 13. Wow. And, and I say that because I remember the, I remember the class that I was in. Um, and I remember Mr. Wong's math class. Um, the thing is, though, like I remember thinking, you know, man, if I tell somebody about this, you now, if I tell an adult, they always say, reach out, right? And I remember thinking, if I tell somebody about this, they're going to say, well, that's Glenn being Glenn. He's, he's a dramatic kid. You know, he, 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 pro- he probably just he wants attention. We know this about him. He wants attention. Um, and that, that struck me as so humiliating. I'd say that struck me as mm. I, I can't. Mm. This was also contextualized, Mark, by the fact and... and we can we can kind of dive deep kind of quickly, and I like if I'm diving too deep too quickly, let me know. But, Never um, too deep. <laughs> he says that now, folks. <laughs> I'd had the experience of of being sexually abused by a family friend when I was real real young. Like mm-hmm. like I've 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 tried to kind of put uh, the time frame around that, um, and and based on the things that I do remember and the people that I do remember, you know, et cetera, you know, we're probably talking around the time of kindergarten, first grade. Mm-hmm. Um, and it happened repeatedly. And, you know, much like any experience of sexual abuse, and you know, especially, um, especially with a little boy, mm-hmm. um, you know, you wind up in this position of like, you know, who, 
who are you going to tell? How are you going to tell? Why would you tell? Mm-hmm. Particularly when you have all these weird feelings about it. It's like, well, I was not a popular kid. You know, mm-hmm. I was, I was, you know, I felt really alienated and isolated. Here was a dude who was paying attention to me. Mm-hmm. And it didn't feel terrible. Mm-hmm. And you get sucked into this thing, and we're going to see this theme over and over again. You get sucked into this thing where it's like, I kind of looked forward to it, and I kind of liked it. Yeah. Yeah. So then you wind up in this position of just crushing shame around it. So when I did tell about that, um, my recollection was like I I finally told um, around fourth grade. Um, And I remember when I told about that, the uh, the sense that I got was again. Oh, that's Glenn. He's he's a weird kid. He's kind of a dramatic wow. kid. Um, do, do we? Is this a thing, or is this just Glenn being Glenn? I didn't really know what to do about it. Um, so fast forward, then come back up to age thirteen mm-hmm. when I'm thinking about ending my life and thinking about thinking about the practicalities of ending my life. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and there was a part of me that's like, oh, should I tell somebody about this? But I remembered that whole thing. Like, oh man, he's a dramatic kid. You know, are we really going to take this seriously? And I, I couldn't. I couldn't imagine that. So we wind up in this position where a few years later, as as a teenager, you know, I'm seeking out everything, and 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 I I wind up kind of into the self help literature. But even then, you know, it, it didn't occur to me that like, why would it occur to me? to go and help other people with this. And like, I'm struggling. So I don't have this figured out. I mean, there's no universe where I could possibly contribute to something. Like I felt Mark that every time I encountered somebody or anytime anybody got too close to me, I was just a drag on them. Mm. So why on earth would I even imagine, you know, the, being a therapist or being a helper? What I wanted, as you alluded to, was I wanted to be a rock star mm. because here's the thing. What do rock stars do? They play on a stage. They're removed from the audience. You know? And mm. the audience, look, they either like it or they don't. They either come. If they purchase a ticket, they're already there. They're already a fan of yours. Mm. I've had nobody giving me crap. <laughs> I could be right. on the stage kind of protected. And I could write songs that made people feel good. Right. Like right. that was kind of my working hypothesis. So that's when, mm. I, started, when I started college. That's a... Unfortunately, at the at the University of Kansas, where I started college as a music major, they didn't have rock star as a major. <laughs> so I had to pick. Like I think, yeah, voice theater. It's close enough. It's close enough. Right. Right. But by the end of that first year, again, I, my functioning was was entirely too compromised by depression, anxiety, yeah. Um, yeah. what I know now to be addictive patterns. Yeah. Um, that I dropped out. You, um, you know, I imagine. I was just thinking. Um, clearly, I'm not a psychologist, but I have been, you know, really diving deeply into a lot of things, and I and I and I find it so sweet that we as human beings have these coping mechanisms, like the one you're describing, yeah. to try to feel better. Mm-hmm. And and it's nothing to it's nothing to ridicule. It's actually quite beautiful that our psyche comes up with something like that. Absolutely, that feels safer, right? Absolutely. You know, there, there was a, um, a psychologist named Carl Rogers. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, that, that, uh, that his, his school of psychotherapy, is, it started out as client-centered therapy, but, which was kind of odd to me. Like, I always thought, shouldn't all therapy be client-centered? Like, doesn't that just make <laughs> right. sense? But, right. but it's now evolved into kind of a philosophy of life called person-centered psychology. But Carl Rogers really strongly believed that, you know, we, we hold the keys to our own happiness and fulfillment and liberation kind of inside us. That uh, you know, he rejected this idea that the therapist is this expert that's going to teach something to, to somebody. And he's like, well, no, right. our job is to really help people discover and unlock what's actually mm-hmm. there inside of us. So no, I agree. I agree. That's, that's actually, I think what I find so wonderful about the things that you say in social media. Hmm. At no point do I, honestly, I'm, I've been getting free therapy from you for a while, just so you know, <laughs> through, through social media, because what happens is whenever you're talking to, to me, to, to the audience on social media, I feel like you've been there 
you're speaking from inside that place. And I, and what happens is I go like, holy shit. Yes. Like, yes, 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 yes. That is what it feels like. That's what, that's what the shit days feel like. Hmm. You know, that's what it feels like to not actually feel like you have a choice. Um, and, and one of the things I really do want to do, I, I, I put aside a few, honestly, there's so much stuff that you put up. That's amazing. But I put aside a few things from, from June, 2023, I just wanted to like read you and have you comment on some of the things you've been posting. Yeah. Um, I wanted to just go back to, to thank you for giving us that, that little bit of backstory. Um, how did you become a, cause, cause so you're a board member of seek safely. Yeah. And I'd love you to talk about what seek safely is, um, why it came about and why it's important. And then I'd love to just go from there if that's okay. No, oh, you bet. Um, I'm actually right now. I'm actually board president of of Seek Safely. Uh, okay. um, Got it. Seek Safely is a a nonprofit organization that advocates. Give you my little spiel. Seek Safely is a nonprofit yeah, yeah, organization please. that advocates for ethics and accountability in the self help industry. Um, and interestingly, my involvement with it is is related to what we were just talking about, kind of my own journey, um, you know, how I wound up in, in the mental health field or even adjacent to the mental health field through uh, self-help. Um, but to give you some background on, on the org, it all started um, <laughs> once upon a time, there was a, a personal development um, guru I guess writer. Um, mm. Can we say his name? Like, like I don't know if we can. I'm like, sure we can. I think it's public. I think it's public. So <laughs> I think it's okay. How, how deep to go? Um, no. So, so there was a, uh, there is a, a, a personal development guy uh, named James Arthur Ray. Um, he was, uh, he was on the rise in, in kind of the the early 2000s. Um, I'm sure everybody remembers uh, the the movie The Secret. Mm. Which is kind of this this faux documentary. Um, it's not really a documentary, but it's 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 kind of a wannabe documentary about um, mm. the, the the law of attraction. Um, mm. Came out in the same era as another uh, another documentary that I seem to remember called "What the Bleep Do We Know." They were kind mm. of they were they, they were compared. Yep. They were compared. Yep. You might we you might first. remember it. I don't know. We came first. You did. You did. Yes, we did. But uh, so, so the secret was, was really popular. It was kind of all these talking heads, um, yeah. mostly self-help folks. You know, it, it, it's interesting. Um, in, in these documentaries, they kind of slap these labels like, you know, James Arthur Ray is a philosopher. He's not really a mm. philosopher. He's, but they right. didn't know what to call him, right? Because they don't have a self-help right. guy. Anyway, um, James uh, had, had written, he had been on The Secret. Um, he, uh, you know, Oprah Winfrey had had you know, folks from the secret on her show, including James. Yeah. And so his profile was, uh, was, was rising. He had, uh, written a really popular, uh, self-help book, uh, titled harmonic wealth. Um, mm. and, oh yeah, uh, I remember that. Yeah. 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 And of the secret guys, he, uh, yeah, he is kind of one of the breakout guys You know, he's kind of telegenic and, and he had his spiel down and whatnot. And, and so he did what, uh, is, is a pretty, um, typical, career trajectory for these guys when when their profile starts to rise like he's like all right now i'm gonna offer these events um and they typically you know, it, 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 it's there's there's this pathway that you know you can you, you know it by rote you don't even i don't even have to describe it it's like he starts out with the free event at the hotel where you come in and it's the mm-hmm. hour or two seminar and it's it's what they call a large group awareness training right and uh you know he pumps you up and he gives you good experience and says boy you feel good now if you want this, if, if you're really committed to your growth and you want this feeling to continue, um, just today, just today, I have like a $5,000 seminar, but just, just today for this group, you can get it for $1,000 if you go to the back right now and sign up. Right. And you do this again and again and again, and eventually you wind up with people at your $10,000 retreat in Sedona, Arizona, which he called Spiritual Warrior. Um, right. It was a, uh, and, and, he, and he was doing this year after year. There's, there's a really good um, description of this in uh, a book titled Tragedy in Sedona by an author named mm. Connie Joy, who was kind of part of James Arthur Ray's ecosystem and just describes this whole process. But 
Um, wound up at a, a, a spiritual, again, he called it spiritual warrior. It was a one week retreat in Sedona, Arizona. And, um, it concluded with, uh, what he called a sweat lodge. Now in the native American tradition, there, there is a, a very sacred spiritual tradition of sweat lodge ceremonies. I don't need right. to tell you, James Arthur Ray is not a native American, right? Nor does he have. Nor does he seem to have a great deal of knowledge of or respect for Native American traditions. Um, his idea was, boy, and he bragged about it. Like his idea was, my sweat lodge is going to be longer and hotter mm-hmm. than anything you'd ever find in the Native American traditions. Mm-hmm. Um, so, long story short, he he got way too many people into a way too hot sweat lodge, and um, you know he didn't know what he was doing. I, I, I think I can authoritatively say that he had no idea what he yeah. was doing and people died. Yeah. Three people died. Lots more were injured. Um, right. And it was international news. Um, he was in the wake of that. James Arthur Ray was convicted of negligent homicide. Um, you know, he was charged with manslaughter, but the charge he was convicted of was negligent homicide. He serves less than two years in prison for this. Um, one of the people who, died in the quote-unquote sweat lodge. I hate calling it a sweat lodge because it's not actually a sweat lodge. It's not, yeah, yeah, yeah. But one of the people who died in that experience was a woman named Kirby Brown. Um, her parents, um, George Brown and Ginny Brown, were um, happened to be psychotherapists. Um, when this all happened, you know, George and Ginny took a look and this said, wow, how could this happen? How could mm. this possibly happen? You know, this was... Uh, you know, not just their daughter, but everybody mm. involved here were, were really smart, successful people. Yet you, you had to be in order to afford the retreat. <laughs> right. 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 Um, so Ginny and George got really interested. And in, in how does this even happen? Um, and, and as they dug into the way James Arthur Ray did business, because they, they were going from the assumption that, well, maybe this was just a guy, like maybe like he was an outlier. Um, and the Brown family started learning more about the self-help business. And they, what they learned, unfortunately, was that James Arthur Ray was not an outlier. Right. Like this was uh, in many ways kind of the standard operating procedures for how the self-help industry worked. They also learned through their experience with the legal system. You know how I said James Arthur Ray served less than two years in prison. One of the reasons mm. for that was it was hard to uh, it was hard to tag him with anything. Um, mm-hmm. He had been operating the way he had been doing business up to the point where he killed people mm-hmm. had been completely legal mm-hmm. um, because there are are very few kind of um, regulations um, around what we call the self help industry. It's really hard to even define what the self help industry is. Like yeah. a secret, for example builds itself as kind of spiritual and metaphysical and whatever is that self-help i mean it unquestionably yeah. is but it's it's slippery right so anyway Ju- yeah. um, Ginny and george brown got really really interested in you know, how this was happening on small scales everywhere you know i mean right. james arthur ray was now an international household name because of what had right. happened but this happens all the time everywhere so they founded the uh, the organization seek safely um mm-hmm with the main goal of educating and empowering consumers of self-help um, to kind of set up some, some guardrails. Like the, the, the thrust of Seek Safely and the goal of Seek Safely is not to bury the self-help industry or anybody in the self-help industry with lots of laws and regulations. Like we don't think that's the solution. Right. What we, what we actually really want is folks to be aware of the fact that, you know, look, there are known dangers in this industry. There are known yeah. demonstrated dangers and it's not just that somebody will die. Yeah. What's far more common in the self-help industry is financial exploitation, spiritual exploitation, interpersonal exploitation yeah. um, of the type that, I mean, we come right up to kind of the, the story of, of, of you guys and the, and the next scene whistleblowers. Yeah. One of my talking points for the last few years has been, you know, boy, you know, if the material that seeks safely you know, puts out and advocates for um, was more widely known, it would have been really yeah. hard for an ecosystem like Nexium yes. to really take root in the way that it did. Yes. 
So that's, that's an overview of kind of where Seek Safely came from. You know, what we do is, you know, we put out content that is, that is uh, you know, educational and supportive, um, both of folks who are engaging with the industry, so yeah. you know, they can recognize red flags, um, so they can contextualize yeah. their self-help and personal empowerment journey in ways that make sense, but, um, but also put them at less risk. You know, we also right. consult with and, and, and advocate for legislative efforts. So, so right now in New York, you know, there's kind of the first in the nation um, effort to kind of codify, you know, look, what are the responsibilities of somebody who makes a living in what we call the self-help industry? Yeah. Like I'm a psychologist, I'm a licensed psychologist. Mm-hmm. Um, what that means is if I do bad things, there is recourse, right? right. Like you can go to a psychology board and right. say, hmm, you should look at this guy's license. There's also an objective kind of set of, of ethical standards against which you can measure my behavior as a psychologist, right? Mm. Mm. What we're advocating for with this legislation is, you know, anybody who makes their living purporting to, you know, offer this kind of advice, this kind of guidance, should at the very least be held to those same standards. There, there should be recourse. There should be clear mm. guidelines. That's an yes. overview of what Seek Safely is. I know that's a that's a long answer to a short question of what no, is no, no, Seek no. Safely. That's, <laughs> that's that's really good. And and you know one of the reasons I also a sort of a side reason I wanted to talk to you as well and and have you on the podcast is because a lot of people reach out to me and say, hey, I'm involved in this group or I know about this group and what do you think? You know, is it a cult? And I'm like, I don't have the time to to look at that and I don't have the the um, the resources, the intellectual resources to to look through everything. What I did do recently is I made a video called uh, What is a Cult? You know, with know, my 25. Loved yeah. You loved it, yeah. So my 25, um, you know, markers, I should say, or strategies of what I think it is. And then people can listen to that and say, okay, well, maybe, maybe based on this it is or it isn't. But I do think more people need to know about it. So if somebody is in a situation where they're not sure if what they're involved in is healthy or not, because usually they've been pretty head fucked at that point, Yep. Um, they can go to the Seek Safely website. What, what would their experience hopefully be? You bet. So one of the things that, uh, that we've done that I think is, is the most useful is that we've kind of broken down the various types of experiences that people tend to have with the self-help industry. So you mm-hmm. have, <laughs> and this is one of the big problems, what is the self-help industry? Mm-hmm. You generally have events and you have... Uh, published material like books and you have kind of online courses like virtual courses which kind of split the difference between the two um you know we've uh defined a series of kind of uh, up front we've defined kind of a series of red flags um, mm. and, and it's very similar to you know the, the work that you've recently done like okay so here are x many markers of what a group might be a cult right Right. What we've put out there is, and, and we don't like to kind of get into like, well, what is a cult? What isn't a cult? Like we find that, that generally mm-hmm. speaking, that label tends to kind of be a, a little polarizing because people are like, well, I would Correct. clearly not get involved with a cult. I will Correct. get involved with an organization that has all these markers, but it's not a cult. It's not yeah. a cult. Yeah. How do I know yeah. that? Because I wouldn't get involved with a cult. Keep up. Of course, because I'm too smart. Right, right. Yeah. Um, anyway, so so no, you, you go to the Seek Safely site and, and you know, we have our series of red flags. You know, just pay attention to this. Pay attention to this. Pay attention to this. Mm-hmm. We also have a tool that we've devised. Um, you know, the, the the logo of Seek Safely is a compass because, you know, I mean, we really view our mission as helping people stay attuned with their central guidance systems, their internal guidance systems. Mm-hmm. Like something kind of going back to that that episode two of the first season of The Vow, something that, that Bonnie, I think, really speaks just just really well to is this idea that in so many self-help like she's speaking of Nexium, but it happens in so many self-help um, mm-hmm. communities where it's like intuition is kind of um, disparaged yeah. it's like well it's that that intuition that, that that's what's keeping you stuck like that's the world yes. controlling you like that's that you need to overcome yes. that and you need to embrace the suck and whatever and seek safely you know we kind of view our mission as like well no we actually need to stay attuned to our intuition and, and yeah. use it as the guidance system, like just like you wouldn't ask a compass where exactly should I go, but you would use it. Say, yes. okay, like, am I on course? Like, am I on track? But the, the compass tool that we have available 
you know, there's north, south, east, west. Each of those points represents um, a fundamental aspect of who you are, what your journey is all about, things to keep in mind. Um, mm -hmm. Things like your core values, things like the experiences that shape you that you need to be aware of, such as trauma. Mm -hmm. um, the idea being that if you think of your journey, if you contextualize your journey as taking place within the bounds of this compass tool, and we have material on there that kind of explains what it is. And um, you know, we actually right. did a webinar a couple of years ago that right. you know, kind of explained it. But the idea is with all of this stuff is to don't lose who you are in this whole thing. Um, you know, mm. So much of uh, what self-help culture is about is brainwashing. Mm. It's literal brainwashing. Not literal brainwashing. People say literally. I guess we're not mm. physically running soap through our brains. but um, well, It feels that way. I'll tell you that much. I know, right? Of course. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. And that's actually not, you know, people say, well, gosh, if you feel like you're being brainwashed by your self-help guy, something's gone wrong. Mm -hmm. I'm going to tell you, it's kind of designed that way. Mm -hmm. It's a feature, not a glitch. Yeah. And if you look at the way many self-help leaders will kind of sell or conceptualize their system, you know, they're not using the word brainwashing, but they're mm -hmm. using that as a selling point. Like you won't be yourself, but why would you want to be yourself? That's a, yeah. You're in the self-help aisle because you hate yourself. <laughs> Let us rebuild you in our image, man. You know what? I want to pick up on uh, sort of the same thing you're talking about right now. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of, there's a lot of modalities in, in, in self-help that are a huge problem. Um, I think one of them and I think this leads into what, you, what you're talking about is this whole idea that you're defective. Yeah. I'd love your thoughts on this, like you're fucked up, you're defective, you're broken, we'll fix you. Yeah, you bet. It's one of the, I would say, cardinal symptoms of, certainly of, of post-traumatic disorders. Like, so the, the way that I conceptualize this gets into more trauma stuff, but the way that I conceptualize the central damage that trauma does to us. Like I think of trauma, complex trauma, as a process of conditioning. Mm. And I really want to move the conversation away from this idea of trauma as this thing that happens to us, as this series of experiences that condition us. Mm. And one of the things that, um, that it conditions us into is this idea that, that, that we are not enough, that we are defective, that we are fundamentally broken. Now, the thing about conditioning is it's, it's not an intellectual exercise. Like, so we don't come through conditioning experiences thinking, yeah, it makes sense that I am defective and it's my fault and I asked for it and, and I perpetuate it, etc. Mm -hmm. It's not that. Which is why I think certain therapists don't... Uh, like, I struggle so much when my cognitive therapists get in my face and they say, look, it's all about your thoughts. Just change your thoughts. Yeah. And I'm like, this isn't, this isn't about reason. Like, this isn't about logic. We can't logic our way out of conditioning. I wish we could. Oh, my God. If we could, yeah. that'd be amazing. Yeah. So trauma conditions us to, to think, yeah, yeah I, am, I am defective. I am, I am not enough. There's something fundamentally wrong with me. Like, going back to my own experience as a teenager, I already felt that way. And I got that message reinforced by the fact that, you know, like, me and my parents seem to live on different planets. Mm -hmm. Um. You know, I would go to school and, and was, was bullied and ostracized. And, and so you get that message again and again and again. Like, what's the, what's the common denominator? Like, mm. that, that, that like, feels like it's you. Feels like it's right. you. So right. we're already starting from, from that position of, again, as I say, if you're even in the self-help aisle, you're probably kind of conditioned into that, that idea that there's something fundamentally wrong with you. Right. The thing about so many self-help ideologies and they are ideologies like like i get a little bit of pushback mm -hmm. when i talk about self-help ideologies but man we're talking systems of belief and systems of allegiance that's ideology man absolutely like it's not philosophy it's ideology mm -mm. <clears throat> when you start out from that place if you're already in the self-help aisle um you don't need to be sold on that idea you already believe it. That's your experience. That is your lived experience. You believe it in your bones, right? Mm -hmm. That means that um, a self-help leader who comes along 
and says, you know, the key to all this is taking responsibility Mm -hmm. for your own experience. Like, like you have to own it and you have to take responsibility for it. That's already going to resonate because you're like, I know I am the problem. It's me. I know. Right. You are so brilliant. How did you know I'm the problem? Person who doesn't know me and hasn't met me. (laughs) Yes. That becomes our base point. It becomes our baseline. It's so true. You know, you got me thinking about something I haven't, I haven't really spoken about, but during the, during filming of the vow, you know, cause it was like almost the three year process of, of shooting. Yeah. I, and Bonnie would have to try to constantly say to me, you're talking, you're saying too much. Hmm. You're ripping your heart out too much. You're saying things that are going to make you look like an asshole. Hmm. And it kind of did happen because what happened is that there are so many people involved in Nixian that never said a word. And some of them did some really bad shit. Yeah. And I felt so deeply responsible for not having seen what was going on that I was going to like just rip my heart out and, and just show the world everything about me to make sure that they could see how it worked, to make sure that they wouldn't fall prey to these, these kinds of things. Yeah. And part of the problem, I think, was that I, I was still in the mode of like, I'm the fuck up, I'm, you know, I'm the problem, I have to, because Ranieri just programmed everybody, you, know, you have to take responsibility more and more and more, and the, more power, the more responsibility you take, the more powerful you, you are. And so some of what, when I look back at the vow now, I think to myself, you know, I could have had a little more discretion. I could have, you know, had a little more self-dignity, but I was so desperate to, to try to get people to understand how it worked that I wanted them to see the internal architecture of, of myself. Um, and, and it wasn't, in retrospect, it wasn't the best thing to do in some ways. I'm, I'm happy, though, that people did get to see that. I do think that was good. But I think I was still very much in the mode of, like, I'm an asshole. So whatever I have to do to make it right, if I have to, and, and you know, the, the process of shooting the vow and the process of, you know, working with the Department of Justice and, and again, the lack of sleep and the feeling of war and the constantly on edge and, uh, you know, the, I'm saying all these things because I think these are things you, you really understand as well. Like yeah. I would jump out of bed. This is pre-trial. I would jump out of bed from fast asleep to standing ready to fight. You bet. And, and be looking for where's the enemy in the room and then Bonnie would have to talk me down you bet. and you say bet. to me like there's, there, there is nothing here you're in the bedroom we're sleeping and like I have to like reorient myself to what's really going on mm. um, but that thing that is, that is there from earlier in life they exploit the, 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 the tremendous shame and this is something I wanted to ask you because I don't think I've ever asked a um, a psychologist this before and I, I want just very plainly like the, this whole shame like I'm a piece of shit yeah like in very simple terms like where does that come from in very simple terms where that comes from I'm going to go back when I said a moment ago you know that word conditioning can't be overstated when we are conditioned into certain Thoughts, beliefs, behaviors, reflexes. Um, it, it, we don't experience something as I'm making a choice to believe this about myself. Mm. We experience it as I know this to be a truth about myself. Mm. Mm. It's, it, it's, it's a lot like, you know, look, we're the goldfish in, in the bowl and we don't know that this is water, right? Mm. And the water has been polluted, but we don't know that. We just think this is it. Mm -hmm. Like this felt lived experience of who I am as fundamentally defective. Like I just know this about myself. Hmm. Hmm. Because we don't have, and again, when we're kids, we certainly don't have an understanding of like, well, no, I have been conditioned through experiences, through programming. And, Mm -hmm. And sometimes I get pushback when, or, when I use that word, because like, you know, are mm-hmm. you telling me that our parents programmed us? Well, yeah. I mean, mm-hmm. our early experiences programmed us. Mm-hmm. Sometimes it was on purpose. Sometimes it wasn't. But 
absolutely went into the code that forms the basis for what we think, mm. feel, believe, do, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I'm thinking as well, when we're little, it's not a question. It's not a. It's not a thing of like I am. I am a person feeling this thing. It's just I am this thing. You bet. I am the feeling I'm having completely and utterly. It overwhelms me. You bet. I feel shit. I am shit. Right. You bet. They, that's, that's a process in, in acceptance and commitment therapy. They call that emotional fusion, right? Like it's, it's okay. this idea that, that we are kind of what we, what we experience. Um, right. What really strikes me, Mark, about what you're describing, um, you know, when you say, well, boy, I got into the situation with, with the vow where I felt it just necessary to just rip everything open and, 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 and let it all hang out. Um, Trauma survivors experience that so often. Um, mm. And let me, and, and I'll preface what I'm about to say with the fact that, man, as I, I think I expressed this to you when we talked a couple of years ago, that as I watched the vow, I watched you know, a group of people who had been traumatized in the relatively recent past, mm -hmm. um, all at various levels and stages of, of recovery. Um, the wounds were all so fresh and, and what just really occurred to me watching was like, you know, so the world is watching this in almost a sense of entertainment, um, yep. Yep. you know, and, and the discourse was such that, I mean, it, 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 it blew up and, and, you know, everybody had an opinion. And so you guys yep. had, I mean, regardless of the work that you're all doing on your own, either in therapy or recovery or whatever, but you guys all had kind of this collective experience of having been through this trauma with the organization and with the leader. And now you were kind of in the midst of what could only be, you know, potentially traumatic, a traumatically stressful experience of mm -hmm. working with kind of this, this public perception, this backlash and, and, what not mm -hmm. and that's and, and it was so apparent to me when when we spoke a couple of years ago mm -hmm. like oh man like i mean this is this is this is a runaway train but that 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 yeah. oh, that, that, that over explaining thing yes 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 so trauma survivors very often and you'll notice like whenever i say something about trauma survivors i i, I take care to say often or it can be the case or it's mm -hmm. it's frequently the case you know, there's, mm -hmm. there's no statement that will ever encapsulate the entire experience of trauma survival for, trauma survival for, for everybody. So mm -hmm. I wanted to be super, super clear. I'm, I'm in no way saying that this applies to everybody at all times. Right. Most of what I say can be framed in terms of trauma survivors, in my experience, tend to mm -hmm. dot, dot, dot. In my experience, trauma survivors tend to fall into this thing of, of over-explaining because one of the fundamental experiences of, of experiences of trauma is frequently feeling fundamentally misunderstood mm -hmm. and fundamentally invisible. Mm -hmm. What I mean when I say that is it's not that people don't see us. Mm -hmm. In fact, often that's the problem that people see us. Mm -hmm but we don't feel seen for who we truly are. Mm. And we don't feel understood for what's actually going on. Mm -hmm. And so we're so often in this position of saying, yeah, I know, but wait, listen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? Um, mm -hmm. This is especially true when shame is operative and, and we feel that, boy, I've made a mess of this. Like if I had to kind of put a caption on my childhood, mm. Um, it would be, boy, did I make a mess of that. Mm. Mm. I was, yeah, I'm a kid. Mm -hmm. And I'm already feeling by age you know, 12, 13 that I've made enough of a mess of this that we should just abort this project. Wow. We should just abort. I have made such a mess of this. Wow. Um, so we wind up in that position of when we have the opportunity to try and explain and explain and explain to maybe get somebody to understand like, look, yeah, 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 I made a mess of it, but please, come on, here's what I was thinking. Like, like mm -hmm. really? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The problem with that, of course, is that no matter how much we say, and no matter how receptive the audience is, right? Like, so you could tell me all about the whole thing, and I could say that, and I could be very empathic and say, yeah, I completely get it, I completely understand, and I give you the benefit of the doubt, mm -hmm. we would still wind up in that place of thinking, no, you, you don't understand. 
You don't understand. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, by the way, I think why I love your social media account. Because mm. whenever I look at stuff, I go, yep, he gets it. Yep, he gets it. He gets it. <laughs> you know, I think that's, I think that is so important. But you're, you're right. I mean, it's, I was thinking, you know, part of like the process of like from 2017, I wake up and I start going to law enforcement mm. and I can't get through to them. And I have lists of like, shit, this, these are the things that I think are crimes and blah, blah, blah. They, they're not getting it. Multiple law enforcement agencies, multiple countries, multiple, you know, like yeah. DEA, FBI, uh, police departments, police intelligence, you know, all kinds. I mean, so many people I spoke to until, of course, you know, the New York Times embarrassed them. Right. And that, and that certainly changed shit, you know. But I remember also there was one... One of my first uh, TV things that, you know, it, it was, and it was very much a have to. It was sort of like, all right, we have to fucking do TV. We have to do whatever we have to do. Because there was no guarantee at that point. We didn't know if, the, if there was an investigation, if it was going to go anywhere. Yeah. So I remember, uh, I'm not going to name the person. She's a very famous person. Um, she was interviewing me, and I was saying something about if you didn't do such and such, you would get punished. And she was like, what kind of punishment? I don't understand. You didn't, it was sort of like intimating, well, you had choice. Right. And I'm like, so you don't fucking have choice. And I'm trying to explain, you know, this coercive, as Yanya Lali says, bound to choice experience, you know, and I, I don't have the words for it because I'm so fucked up still. Yeah. And I'm on, you know, national television trying to explain. And I just remember thinking, I have to figure out how to explain this better. Which in some ways was good because I did, as I went on and on and on and talking to more and more people, I started to figure out how to explain it and, and use metaphors. But... But I was, yes, I was still in that thing of over explaining everything. And Bonnie would say, stop over explaining. Right. Some, some answers are yes or no. Yeah. You know? And then, of course, by the time I got into court, you know, it was very much the advice was always don't say too much. Just right. think about the question, answer the question. They're trying to get you, you know, they're right. after you. And, and that's what happened, of course. They, they tried to in, sort of suggest that I had spent. 10 years plotting this, this thing, you know, to take the great <laughs> Keith Raniere down. It was, a, it was a 10 year process, apparently. You know, I've been plotting it all along. <laughs> Such patience, you know? Mark. That's, that's oh, admirable. <laughs> so, I mean, I don't, I don't have that patience. I'm just, I'm way too <laughs> impulsive. So I want to just, um, I know we're, 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 we're running into the end of our hour, but um, if we can just go a little further, I want to ask you, yeah. what is, what is, what is good and what's bad about self-help? Like what's the, so we talked a bit about the bad, but like what's good self-help look like? Lots of thoughts about that. Yeah. Before I, before I do that, just, just to quickly return to what you just said. Mm. Um, it's my belief that our culture is in strong denial about the, the existence and power of conditioning. Yes. We strongly, strongly, strongly want to believe that we make our decisions rationally and and we want to believe in kind of this this the supremacy of, of free will mm. and people will push back on this idea that well no i why did i do this because i was conditioned to respond this way people hate that yes. idea and they will yes. vigorously attack it so i yes, think that's probably right. one of the reasons why you got that um mm. that response and it's one of the big things that when people get into trauma recovery and, and trauma therapy, that uh, you know, we, we really have to kind of chip away at this, this delusion that we have, that we are making kind of these, these always you know, fully informed adult free will decisions. Um, mm -hmm. There's a book that um, the, the famous behavioral psychologist B.F. Skinner wrote mm -hmm. once upon a time that got him into all sorts of trouble. It was called Beyond Freedom and Dignity. Mm. And so Skinner was a radical behaviorist. I'm gonna give a shout out to my undergraduate mentor, Dr. Robert Cicerone, for introducing me to B.F. Skinner, because he's a fascinating guy if you read his books. Just really, really mm. interesting. But Beyond Freedom and Dignity was this book that Skinner wrote all about how we are shaped by our reinforcement history. And Skinner even really had some questions about, does free will even exist? Like we are kind of these collections mm. of, of conditioned responses mm -hmm. and he raised mm -hmm. some really interesting philosophical questions got ratioed man like nowadays we'd say he got ratioed um because people hated that idea so that's that's part of what um 
you ran into with kind of the whistleblowing experience as part of what trauma survivors deal with every day. Like, what are you mm -hmm. stupid? Are you, are you weak willed? Yep. Are, are you, yep. you, you have no character, you have no honor. Like, like yep. what's up with you that, that you were vulnerable to conditioning as if we aren't all yep. extremely vulnerable to conditioning at all times. Yep. So I had to get that, yes. that in there before. No. And actually, I don't know if you heard, if you heard or saw my last episode, um, where I talked about weaponizing filmmaking, filmmaking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But that one where I show the, 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 the military psyop, uh, advertising oh, nice. campaign. Yes. That shit right there is astounding because they understand exactly what they're doing. They've understood for a long time and the public's like, no, you can't brainwash people. You can't, of course you can, you know? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You asked about, about good self-help. So, you know, we think a lot about this at, at Seek Safely. So the founder of Seek Safely, um, um, uh, Ginny Brown and I have, have, have such a wonderful relationship and, and we've had so many fascinating conversations about what makes for good self-help. Mm -hmm. um, I'll, I'll never forget what one time, this was a couple of years ago, like I, I was going to visit them and I, and I showed up at, at, at the Brown's house and, and Ginny Brown was reading a book that I have right here called You Can't Afford the Luxury of a Negative Thought. It's, mm. it's, it's a famous self-help book by Peter McWilliams. And mm -hmm. um, on the Seek Safety podcast, uh, Gene Brown and I, um, I'm Kirby Brown's sister, um, we recently talked about Peter McWilliams and kind of that whole thing. And I, Ginny was reading this book, you can't, you can't Afford the Luxury of a Negative Thought. I'm like, oh, Peter mm -hmm. McWilliams, like, do you know his whole story? Because he was a cult survivor as well. He actually got sucked into a cult and he wrote all these self-help books while in the cult. Really? Um, the guru of the cult, um, a, a self-help figure by the name of John Roger. Again, like if you go to the, the Seek Safely podcast and we tell this entire story. But yeah, 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 yeah he course. had convinced Peter that he was Peter McWilliams, that, that, uh, that Peter um, was going to die of AIDS if... Peter um, didn't continue to publish these books and put John Rogers' name on them. Oh, my God. It was this whole thing. But the point is, so Ginny, who is the founder of Seek Safely and a psychotherapist, was reading this book. And I'm like, oh, do you know that whole story? And she's like, I have no idea. I'm like, huh. You might want to know the story as you kind of engage with that material. Yes. Um, and we see this a lot. We see that uh, you know people love... Um, you know, there are these very well-known self-help titles. And I think of self-help mm -hmm. primarily kind of through books. Like I know that, that we're in a new era of it's mm -hmm. Instagram, it's TikTok, it's, it's, it's a lot of yeah. online content. But I'm old school. Like I always think of books as kind of the gateway yeah. into yeah. the self-help world because they were my gateway into the self-help world. But there are extremely popular influencers and authors and, and, and self-help gurus. Um, mm -hmm. Who, who put out material that a lot of people engage with and a lot of people take great meaning of, but take great meaning from, but they've kind of dropped the seeds of what will become exploitative philosophies and, and, and pathways, mm -hmm. kind of even in this kind of popular benign stuff. Mm -hmm. Just taking that example, John Roger had a really popular series of intro seminars called Insight Seminars. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. You remember this? Yeah. yeah. And, and, and people swore by insight. People loved insight. It's very similar to uh, Est. Mm -hmm. like, like people loved Est. Like, like yes, like, you know, Est is, is, is the thing. Not realizing that if you kind of delved into it, there were the seeds of what could become more exploitative philosophies and yeah. paths embedded in it. Yeah. So, so this question of like, what is good self-help? I'm always going to say that, look... There is the potential for good self-help in, in lots of, look, lots of spiritual traditions, lots of intellectual traditions. Nexium had really interesting tidbits, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like as, as you look at, uh, at, at kind of the intro Nexium stuff, um, Scientology. Here's, wow, I'll, I'll, I'll say something controversial on the WTF yeah. is on my mind podcast. Yeah, yeah. Scientology has really interesting tidbits. Mm -hmm. about autonomy mm -hmm. and, and, um, and, 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 you know, kind of rational thinking and, and, mm -hmm. and, and honor. Like we talk about the concept of honor and living up to your word and your integrity, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, is that good self-help? 
depending on how we interact with it, sure. Like if you're following your compass, again, kind of that, that seek safety compass tool, mm -hmm. and if you're doing mm -hmm. so with the, with the guardrails of the red flags, yeah, absolutely, man. Mm. Like I think there's a reason why people come away from like intro Scientology courses and intro Nexium courses thinking, boy, sign me up. This is amazing. Yeah, yeah. Where does it become bad self-help? In my mind, it becomes bad self-help when the, you know, there's, there's a concept in psychology called locus of control, mm -hmm. right? Like, so there's an internal locus of control or an external locus of control. At a certain point in many self-help ideologies, I'm going to use that controversial word again. There's mm -hmm. a certain point in, in self-help ideologies where the locus of control is shifted from an internal locus of control to an external locus of control. The way that it's usually framed is, well, you've come this far, mm -hmm. but if you really want to take that next step, mm -hmm. then you're going to have to surrender some of this control. You're going to have to do the Indiana Jones thing in The Last Crusade where he steps off the thing. You're going to have to take that leap of faith, mm -hmm. right? And a lot of people think, boy, I've trusted this ideology so far and I've gotten some good mm -hmm. results. Mm -hmm. Maybe they're right. Maybe yes. I just need to, you know, put the blinders on and hand over the money and just take this next step. Once yes. you've done that, you wind up with what we call the sunk cost fallacy. Yes. And you're like, I'm already in this ecosystem. I've already spent this money. We wind up convincing ourselves that, well, I don't know, maybe it wasn't as awesome as the first step, but maybe I just don't quite get it yet. Maybe I need to spend mm -hmm. another grand. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Maybe I need to trust them just a little more. That's where it starts so to become accurate. toxic. So accurate. I mean, I, I was just thinking as you were speaking, I remember an argument I had with Ranieri in 2017. I think it was 2017. Mm -hmm. Maybe 16, end of 16, where I said to him, so all these people doing this particular, it was Ethicist 2, I think. It was this you know, long, long course that cost $10,000. I said, all these people doing Ethicist 2 are miserable. And this, you call this the science of joy. It's, it doesn't look like the science of joy to me at all. And mm -hmm. then he kept on going on about, you know, the, the, the 40 days and 40 nights in the desert bullshit. And, you know, and I'm like, yeah, but you would think that they would have a fuller sense of themselves, not mm -hmm. less of themselves. Mm -hmm. And then he spun some other bullshit. And, and basically what he was trying to get me to, to, to understand is that I didn't understand what it, what it takes. Right. And a part of me was like, yeah, that's probably true. Another part of me, yeah, but these people are fucking miserable. The women are emaciated and unhappy. And I was coaching some of them, you know, I was, I was, you know, we each coached each other and I was coaching some of the people that turned out to be DOS masters mm -hmm. and they were just fucking angry and they just wanted to leave. And I would say to them, then leave. That's yeah. the kind of coach I was, <laughs> you know, so you, then leave. You right. should go. You should go pursue your dreams. I was always on, on about my dreams. And by the way, I was thinking, I was in a dream last night. I remembered that at an executive board meeting once, maybe it was 2015, I was sitting with everybody listening to him go on and on and on. And I said, you know, I think that we've lost sight of things. This is me and my na naivete. Mm -hmm. Aren't we supposed to help people with our dreams, their, their dreams? I mean, isn't this like, this should be a dream factory. That's what we should be doing. We should yeah. be like finding out what people want. If it's in the, uh, you know, within our boundaries of, of, you know, our morality and ethics that we think is good, then let's help them have it. But like we're dream killers, you know, like what yeah. about their dreams? And Ranieri said to me something like, well, you have to be careful with that, you know, because then they may not want to the tech anymore. And I'm like thinking, <laughs> yeah, I didn't say anything at that point, but I'm like, yeah, but then that's what we, what, this, what we want. We should want to put ourselves out of a job because they got what they wanted. Maybe they'll come back, maybe they, they won't. I was very yeah. naive. I was very naive. Um, Dr. Doyle, I want to just jump to something that I think is really fascinating. Because you meditate, right? Yeah. Okay. So I want to ask you about, there's many people that leave these kinds of groups and organizations say like meditation is bullshit. It does terrible things to you. It disconnects you. Mm -hmm. And I think to myself, well, I don't know. Meditation can dissociate you. 
depending on how you do it, or you can deeply associate into yourself. You bet. I just wanted to get your thoughts on that because that's my current sort of theory. Mm -hmm. No, you bet. So it's it, it, it's interesting you mentioned that. I'll, I'll tell a, a quick story um, about exactly what you're talking about in terms of mm. you know, meditation can be a tool, and just like any tool, right? Like a, a hammer can build a house. In fact, it's really hard to build right. a house without a hammer. You right. can also mash your digits, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, Connie Joy, in, in, in her book, Tragedy in Sedona, um, Connie Joy describes being at a James Arthur Ray retreat where he would do, one of the things they would do is, is um, what's called holotropic breath work and um, guided meditation. Oh, yeah. And, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. One of the themes of, of the guided meditation you know, you know, was like, you know, are you willing to do what you need to do, like to take the next step? And so he was, so James mm -hmm. would lead his folks in these guided meditations and yeah, get him at the state of like complete connection with their own willingness to take the next step. And then he would just kind of slip in. Maybe the next step is buying my program, blah, blah, blah. Mm. And say, I don't know. Fuck and if it. you're experiencing resistance to that, well, then maybe that's your resistance, right? Like, like maybe you need to work on that. And are you willing to overcome that resistance and buy my program? So I, I, I recently wrote about, you, you might have seen it, like one of my um, recent uh, tweets. Anymore, we've got dozens of social media platforms and like tweets, threads. I'm, I'm so lost on where, I'm on where I'm I say what. <laughs> yeah. But on one of these platforms, I recently said, you know, a, a core part of my approach to trauma recovery. And when I say, so I very specifically say trauma recovery, not trauma therapy. Mm -hmm. um, because this whole thing, like therapy is a tool or can be a tool of recovery. Mm -hmm. But even if every therapist in the world disappeared tomorrow, your job is still trauma recovery, right? Like right. recovery is 24-7, right. 365. Um, right. So I very rarely talk about therapy. I'm actually, I'm, I'm, I'm a bad psychologist. I'm not terribly interested in therapy. Um, I'm mm. really interested in recovery. But mm. therapy is this little teeny mm. tiny piece of like, man, I talk to most of my folks for an hour or two a week. You know, wow. they're, you know, I'm the coach in the corner. Like they're in the fight, man. Right. Anyway, right. a cornerstone of, of my approach to trauma recovery is what I call naturally altered states of consciousness. Um, mm -hmm. specifically because rewinding to when I was a teenager and all fucked up, um, one of the few things that really moved the needle for me was self-hypnosis. I, I stumbled upon mm. a series of self-hypnosis tapes. I'll give him a shout out. Dr. David Illig of Success World um, mm. had these, these self-hypnosis tapes and I didn't know what self-hypnosis was. I didn't know what hypnosis was. Um, but... Again, I'm kind of this open-minded kid. I'm into the force. I'm like, I'm really interested. Mm -hmm. I'm like, oh, you're telling me that there are reserves inside me. Like we were talking about Carl Rogers and it's all inside you. Like there's this thing inside me that mm -hmm. I can make contact with. If only I can quiet this down. Mm -hmm. I'm into mm -hmm. it, man. I'm into it. You know, like I'm going to lift the X-wing out of the swamp. I'm into it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's my experience that... When we're going through our life, we're running programs. I'm not really a computer guy, but I use all these computer metaphors. We're, 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 we're running mm -hmm. programs. And you run a program, it's going to run the same way every time because there are physiological grooves in our nervous system. That's what we're yep. running programs. We're running on the hardware. Right? Yep. If we're going to change substantively, consistently, what we believe, what we think, how we feel, what we do... We have to interrupt those patterns. This is an old uh, neuro linguistic programming idea. Like, you got to interrupt the pattern. Right. You got to scratch the record, right? right? The kids these days don't know what I'm talking about when I say scratch the record. Yeah, but, you know, yeah exactly. Scratch the record. One of the few effective ways to do that is getting into a naturally altered state of consciousness. Mm -hmm. um, meditation's one way to do that. Um, mm -hmm. Meditation works when we're able to, uh, you know, kind of activate, and this goes into a whole body of theory about about the vagus nerve and, and whatnot that we can talk about some other time. But 
you know, mm-hmm. when, when we can, can trip that vagus nerve and, and when we can have an actual effect on the frequency of our brain waves, mm-hmm. going from beta to alpha to delta to theta, et cetera, et cetera. Mm-hmm. It's an effective way to, to kind of get out, to kind of shake awake, to kind of get out of that state, to kind of trip that pattern, to, 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 to mm-hmm. fuck up that pattern that's fucking us up. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The problem is whenever we induce a naturally altered state of consciousness, it introduces temporarily, um, neuropsychologically, it introduces a state of disorganization. And when we are disorganized, we are suggestible. Yes. So this is what James Arthur Ray was doing when he was you know, yes. kind of slipping that in. This is what, yes. um, honestly, uh, from what I understand of, of, of the Nexium curriculum, this is part of what was happening in EMs. Very much. Very much right? so. You, you would introduce kind of a different uh, neuropsychological, physiological state. And mm-hmm. during that moment of disorganization, you inserted a new meaning in there. Yep. And yep. because we're temporarily suggestible, you know, it, it has an opportunity. It has an opportunity to take root. Yep. Um, yep. So on the one hand, getting into those states is really important to shifting our consciousness, to, to, to shifting our, our mode of operating. On the other hand, boy, do we have to be mindful of, of what yes. we're letting in you know, in those moments. Yes. Yeah, yeah. No, that absolutely makes perfect sense. I, you know, I, I, I want to, I'm probably going to talk more about this at some point. You know, I, I have been thinking about, because I, I meditate, you know, uh, regularly now. Yeah. I abandoned everything for a while. And uh, I don't listen to anything else like i don't put myself in a state where i'm listening to anything else yeah you know i am sort of my my own um counsel but i found that the way i use meditation now is to is to just listen very deeply and feel very deeply what i'm feeling um and i'm finding that that state of presence is incredible there is a kind of the, the reorganization thing is interesting. There is a kind of organization that occurs that I do not understand at all. You bet. I don't know what the fuck's going on. Call it higher self, angels, whatever the fuck you want to call it. You I bet. don't know. But there is something that, that reorganizes in those states. And then I, I, I seem to have a better understanding of things or a better feeling or a better whatever. You bet. You know, it's very profound. It's a com- complete mystery. At some point, I think I, I will probably um, take the work that I did in What the Bleep and take it, you know, a little in a little different direction, you know. Sure. That was a, that was a very different time. One more question I want to ask you before I read some of your amazing, um, I call them memes, really little <laughs> mini poems. But I wanted to talk about the role of anger in trauma recovery, and the reason um, I wanted to talk about anger was because. I think that people have such a, such a, such a, it gets a bad rap. I think anger gets a a very bad rap. You bet. And there was a time, it was pre-trial, when Bonnie and I were spending time with a lot of different um, sort of cult experts. We were living with some of these people, like in in the cameras are rolling all the time. We're talking, you know, and and one of them said to, to Bonnie, you know, the anger you have is not sustainable. And, and we, spoke afterwards and said well fuck that person because <laughs> this is the fuck where we are right now yeah. you know fuck sustainable we're in a war and in my case as as unhealthy as it might have been rage was my fuel you bet rage was what made me spend months and months and months with the department of justice going through stuff again and again and again yeah got me on the stand got me you know not shitting in my pants because I was, I was afraid. I was afraid I was going to fuck, fuck things up and he, and he wasn't going to get put away. Yep. And I, you know, I keep thinking about anger and I think that, 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 that society is anger phobic and I feel very deeply, and although I have no training in this, I feel very deeply that anger is a, a, is a necessary step that should not be stopped. Like I, I work with a lot of, um, on different projects, I work with a lot of victims now yeah. on the different films that I'm making. And the one thing I'm very clear on is when they're in, having a rage attack and they're raging, I just roll the camera. Mm-hmm. I am not trying to stop anything because it feels like, feels like that's necessary. I just wanted to 
get your thoughts. This is my uninformed, you know, <laughs> theory. Mark, something that that I love is is you keep saying, "Well, this is my uninformed theory," and I and I have no no, no <laughs> training or experience. You know, well, I you, haven't you were, studied this shit. It's just what I'm feeling. Well, well you were a coach for years, um, mm. and mm. I mean, you know, sure, it's it's the case that you were working within a an ideology that that turned out later to you know, to be problematic. That said, that work that you did with people was real. Um, mm. you know, you have a lot of, of extremely practical experience as kind of a practical psychologist, mm. I would say. So, so you're not coming to this cold, man. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's interesting you say that. I, I agree with what you're saying, but it's, but it's interesting because, because in our particular, uh, ideology, um, emotions were seen as problematic. Those kinds of yeah. emotions were seen as problematic. And that's why I'm thinking, I think, that, oh, I wonder if people were willing to feel more of their anger. Mm. Would they process better or sure. faster? I don't know. Oh, you know it. You know it. So you're right. Uh, emotions generally, and anger specifically, get a get a bad rap. Like like I'm I'm, I'm here thinking specifically of the, there's this cognitive psychologist on 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 social media who recently had the I, I was thrilled to be blocked by him because I'm like if I'm getting blocked by him I'm doing something right. <laughs> But he's one of these guys who, who is like, you know, no, look, emotions are such a poor guide for life decisions. It's your thoughts. It's your thoughts and your reason mm. and, and, and whatever. And you can kind of trace that back through a whole. There's a whole kind of rationalist tradition that is emotion phobic um, because yeah. you know, uh, emotions are seen to be as, as, as not tools of certainly not tools of cognition, but not tools of, of effective decision making. Um, you know, there's a, a psychologist that I that I really like. Um, one of the first guys to really write about self-esteem, um, Dr. Nathaniel Brandon. Um, mm. You know, his his seminal work was was titled "The Six Pillars of of Self-Esteem." And what's interesting about Dr. Brandon's work is he actually came out of the intellectual tradition of Ayn Rand and intellectual or uh, objectivism. Mm. Mm. So, and it, in fact, at one time, at one point, he was having an affair with Ayn Rand. So, so oh, it's really, a, it's a fascinating story. Wow. It's, 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 like I'm full of interesting stories from the history of self help. If I talk about wow. it sometime, but anyway, that Ayn Rand objectivism tradition is all about how how look you can noodle your way through anything. You can rationalize your way through anything. Rationality is the thing. Like if you read Ayn Rand's books, all the heroes are are perfectly rational, and all mm -hmm. the villains are these reactive emotional types yes um, that's a good point what uh where dr brandon had his his break with ayn rand was over you know partially over the issue of of emotions because brandon was like you know look emotions are an essential source of information um you know fundamentally they carry the message of this thing that i'm confronted with you know, is this thing adaptive to my survival or is this thing a threat to my survival? And how am I going to know that by how I'm feeling? Mm. Um, our feelings can be conditioned. Our feelings can be distorted sometimes by kind mm. of what we believe and what we think, etc. And And certainly, mm. I mean, feelings can be weaponized by abusers and manipulators, gurus, etc. But mm. the point is they're, they're a source of information. They're designed as a source of information. Mm hmm Anger specifically, and boy, we could do a whole podcast about this because the mm. role of anger in trauma recovery is essential. Mm. When we think about the fact that anger was selected for in our evolutionary history, why? When we were cave people, um, you know, the, the, the cave people who could get angry had a survival advantage. Mm when the other cave people came along and tried to steal our cave mate and our, our mastodon meat, the metaphor is mm. getting away from me, whatever mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it gave us a, you know, that the cave people who were able to get angry had focus and had energy that allowed them to defend, right. And to protect mm. carry that through now. You know, when we realize that we need to be in recovery, and make no mistake, that's the moment. Like the moment, mm -hmm. just like uh, in addiction recovery, so I'm also a recovering addict. 
just mm. like when we make that decision, like, okay, this is something that I've got. It's got to be the lens through which I, I live my day. It's got to. It's got to. Mm-hmm. I don't have the option of waking up tomorrow and not being a trauma survivor or not being an addict, mm. right? Mm. And that's why step one of the 12 steps is all about acceptance. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Radically mm-hmm. accepting that. Mm-hmm. When we realize that, man, this is something I got to do every day, the question arises, how can I possibly sustain this? Mm. Like you've said, this process of confronting Ranieri and, 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 and Nexium, it will burn you out. Yep. It will depress you. It will burn you out. It will, it will run you into the ground. How can I sustain that? Yeah. I need access to that thing. If you can hear, we've got sirens going on. I don't know if that's I, a problem. I heard that. I was thinking, that's, that's interesting. <laughs> Welcome to Chicago. About this. <laughs> yeah. Oh, right. We need access to that, that state that gave our cave ancestors focus and, and, and clarity and energy mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. to sustain the level of effort that is necessary for, for recovery. Yes. I often say that um, you, can, you can probably find a quote of mine in, in many places on the internet that uh, says, you know, look, I didn't make real progress in my own recovery until I got good and angry. Mm. And very often we've been conditioned to turn that anger where? We've been conditioned to be angry at ourselves. Right. To be angry right. at ourselves for being weak, for being naive, for being, you know, how could I, how could yes. I have, like when I work with, with cult, you know, survivors of cults and high control groups, the question is most often comes up is like, how could I have been so stupid? Mm-hmm. You know, how could mm-hmm. I have allowed myself to be made into an abuser? Mm-hmm. Right. And so we mm-hmm. th- we're conditioned to turn that, like whenever we have a negative emotion, this is one thing that trauma conditioning does. Whenever we have a negative emotion, we're conditioned to first turn that toward ourselves and it's framed as accountability right well of course you, know, you, you need to be accountable like you're feeling a bad thing how are you responsible for that bad thing there are no ultimate oh, yes. victims yep. so how are you responsible for that thing getting good and angry at the right people and the right institutions and the right dynamics is often that 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 key moment in recovery that 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 mm. turns everything around. Like I'm not really a believer in, in all sorts of key moments. Like people are like, yeah, I had this aha moment. Well, mm. mm-hmm. the truth is we have little aha moments every day. Every day, yeah. And sometimes yeah. we have an aha moment that turns out to be like a uh, moment later. <laughs> <laughs> but one of the real aha moments really, really is. Wait a minute. Again, I think of it as the wake up moment. Like, wait a minute, mm-hmm. they were the adult. Mm-hmm. Wait a minute. He was the priest. Wait a minute. Yes. You know, there's no universe yes. in which this could have been my fault. Yes. Key moment. Yes. That makes so much sense. Uh, thank you for, for that take on evolutionary biology, because that really that makes a lot of sense. Um, I want to just quickly look at some of the... Um, some of your amazing quotes on social media. One of them that I loved, and this is literally just from June. There's so much of your material. But one of the ones I loved is you said, I guarantee you that trauma survivor in your life who you think of as fragile would much rather have a brutal but honest conversation about something than have you lie or avoid something to protect their feelings every Mm -hmm. time, every single time. I was like, so the reason I like it as well, there's another one. Let me just see if I can find it. Oh, maybe I didn't choose this one. There was one where you spoke about small talk. Yeah. Yeah. And how we have this deep intolerance for small talk. And I thought it was so powerful because that is how, how I feel right now. I mean, I've always been the kid, probably like you, yeah. that I, I was more interested in one-on-one conversations and going deep. You bet. But I cannot tolerate small talk. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, when I read when I read your thing, I was like, oh yeah, yeah, he knows, he knows what that's like. <laughs> I, I remember vividly one of my friends in graduate school. We, we we were talking about our respective relationship difficulties, and she goes, well, Glenn, one of your problems is that your idea of a first date is is sitting down with somebody and saying, tell me everything, 
And yes. don't leave anything out. <laughs> yes. I'm yes. like, huh, you're, you're probably right about that. That's true. Um, yes. Here's, here's my take. The, the small talk thing, it, it, it's, it's super interesting. I never know which of these things is, is going to resonate with people. Um, you know, sometimes I'll write something and I'll think, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, I've got a thing. Mm-hmm. And then for whatever reason, it doesn't take off. But then that thing yes. was kind of a thought that I had. Um, I spend my day, I have the privilege, the incredible privilege of spending my day talking almost only to um, people who have survived complex trauma. Mm. And something that I notice about that is that, you know, man, usually I'm not the first therapist they've been to. Right. And when I ask about like, so past therapy experiences, I don't want to repeat past mistakes. Mm-hmm. And so I ask like, so what was that like for you? Well, mm-hmm. there was a lot of this, like, you know, it's talking about stuff that really doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. And I really want to have actual conversations about things that matter. Mm-hmm. And not only does that resonate for me as a therapist, cause I'm like, hell yes, you are paying far too much money for this in the first place. Yes. Yes. And I don't care how much you're paying for therapy. It's too much, including if you're working with me, you're paying too much. Um, Yes. But you're paying far too much money to make small talk with somebody. Um, Right. Right. But in addition, trauma survivors tend to live in this world, this culture of denial, of, of disowning, of silence. We are not a culture who likes to talk about trauma. We will happily exploit it for the purposes of entertainment as you know, right? Like as you've had very direct experience with, right? Yes. Um, But we don't like to really talk about it. We don't like to talk about things like coercive control. We love our cold documentaries. Yeah. But we don't like to talk about how the dynamics that make something like Nexium possible are entirely Mm -hmm. operative in our everyday world. Entirely operative. Political campaigns are are a perfect example. Perfect. Absolutely. But my point is that um, all this stuff is happening all around us. And trauma survivors are saying, man, I'm experiencing all of this, but no one wants to have an, an honest conversation about it. Yes. Like everyone wants to have the conversation that they're comfortable with. Yeah. But here I'm having yeah. this experience that I feel alone in. And, 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 and mm-hmm. I feel like a freak. I feel like I, uh, I feel like a drama mm-hmm. queen going back to how I felt. Like, I feel mm-hmm. like, like I'm just this dramatic kid who there must be just, I'm mm-hmm. a weirdo. Mm-hmm. Um, so when folks mm-hmm. actually get into therapy with a trauma informed, a trauma focused therapist, they tend to be deeply appreciative of that opportunity to say, you know, let's, 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 let's drop the pretense. You know, let's, let's right. talk about some real right. shit. We've been to the circus. I don't know if I said this in the tweet or not, but you know, my, my analogy is often like, we've been to the circus. We've seen the clowns. We don't need it. We don't yes. need it. Yes, yes, so, yes. So many of our resources for so long have been spent compartmentalizing and second guessing and putting up this fucking mask. Yep. You know, Jesus, how am I going to live this next act? Am I going to do this for another 40, 50? Am I going to do this? Yeah. Let's get real. There's another great one that I um, found today. I've seen it before. I I, I found it again. Um, You said it's very normal to feel anger towards people who give you shit about your reluctance to forgive or reestablish contact with someone who hurt you. Those people don't get that you established those boundaries for a reason. And it was about safety, not lack of charity. That really spoke to me. It really spoke to me because I, because I know I've been given shit about, well, why are you still angry at this, at that person? Why, why do you not want to talk to them or whatever, you know? But, and I'm like, you don't get it. It's not healthy. No. And I mean, I still have, you know, a couple of, maybe two years ago, uh, Ranieri was trying to reach out to me from prison. Really? And se- send me messages. And so my former friends were calling me and messaging me. Hmm. And pretending like they just wanted to connect and you know that and i knew that they were doing it because he told them to do it yeah and i just i decided that i couldn't talk to them you know yeah. and then i have some people saying well you know you should like learn forgiveness i'm like that's not about forgiveness motherfucker it's about my sanity you know absolutely 
Absolutely. You know. You know. That's, you know, that this, this whole thing of what, what I, I think so many people don't understand about the experience of, of trauma survivors is that we go through the world every day being told in little and big ways, you're wrong. Mm -hmm. You're wrong about calling the experience trauma. Get that a lot. Was it really trauma? Yeah. Was it really trauma? Was it just an uncomfortable experience? Uh. Right? We're told we're wrong about how we're reacting to it. Like, well, clearly, if you're having flashbacks and, and suicidal depression and stuff, there's something broken in you. You're doing life wrong, right? Yes. We're told yes. we're wrong for our perceptions. We're told we're, we're wrong for our reactions. We're told we're wrong in our perception of what we need. Mm. Because sometimes we say, look, what I actually need, what would be really great is a safe relationship. Sometimes that's therapy. You know, a safe relationship and a safe space where I could just be who I am in my anger and my brokenness in my, and in my strength, like whatever. Right. Right. And not have to fucking justify it, not have to fucking apologize for it. Right. That's what I need. Yeah. And the culture tells us, well, you're wrong for that because we don't always get what we want. Right. Like, it would, you know, mm. you, how immature are you that you have this fantasy of being allowed to just be yourself? Come on. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So we're told yeah. again and again and again every day in these little and big ways that, uh, that we're wrong. And the forgiveness thing, it tends to be such a big part of that. Like there is a, a, so true. a large, um, a, a strong streak in our collective. Um, it's not even really our collective psychology. It's more our collective ideology um, that it says, you know, look, in order to move past something, you know, you, you know, you, you're not going to move past something and just continue to feel terrible about it. So you have to let it go mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. as if the process of letting it go was a decision you make. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So not true. So not the case. Um, by the way, I found the thing you said, just to go back to the small yeah. talk thing. You said trauma survivors often develop the severe aversion to small talk. Sometimes superficial chit chat even makes us annoyed or angry. You know? It's nothing personal. We've just gotten real clear on how precious our bandwidth is and real selective on how we're willing to allocate it. That was the one I saw that I loved so much. You know it. Okay, there's, there's another one I want to read, read yeah. you. You know these very well, but I want to read it to you. <laughs> um, I'm, I want to read it to the audience, you know, and just if you have any other thoughts. But you said, the fact that we were groomed to accept abuse can make us feel crazy when later in life people tell us to stand up for ourselves. It feels wrong, like a trick, a practical joke. Reconditioning ourselves for self-respect can feel uncomfortable. We're waiting for the catch. I love that. Waiting, I love that. Wait, waiting for the other shoe to drop. Th this actually, when, when you read that back to me, Mark, it, it reminds me of kind of taking us back to the self-help industry. Um, it reminds me of something that you often see happen at large group awareness trainings. I'm sure you saw a version of it in, in certain Nexium trainings where mm -hmm. the facilitator will ask a participant. So if this happened to you, what would you do? Or, or, mm -hmm. or what, what's your, what's your reaction to this? What are your thoughts about this? And the person, the participant will give what they think they're supposed to say but it's never the case that, that the facilitator is asking that with the intention of being going, wow, that's a really good answer. All right, let's move on. Yeah. Yeah. The facilitator is always asking that to use it as an example of what not to do. Correct. So they can then tell you what you should do or a better way to do it. Right? Yes. Over time, we get used to that. We get used to like, well, okay. Um, the only reason why somebody would ever want me to talk about my experience is to tell me that I'm doing it wrong and to suggest mm -hmm. a different way of doing it and maybe sell me a product to do it better. Right. Mm -hmm. So we get into this thing of like, well, man, why would I even want to engage that? You're just going to tell me I'm wrong. You're just going to tell me mm -hmm. like the entire culture tells me I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. So we get mm -hmm. really, really selective about who we're willing to engage with. Mm -hmm. that is so true and then that experience gets installed into us 
and now it's almost like part of us is policing ourselves to like don't don't go there don't even have that thought don't have hope you bet don't have this don't have that you bet that that has taken for me it's interesting related unrelated but related like taking up space has taken me some time i'm not there yet it's taken me time to to feel better about it like yeah. you know i have these social media accounts now i have this podcast i have these different things um i didn't want to i didn't want to do the vow like it wasn't something i dreamed about saying oh my god you know what i want to do one day i want to crack my chest open see have the whole world see like my worst moments of my life yeah um but in terms of me now putting myself out there more because understand in nixium whenever i was self-full i was criticized of course and i was told you know you're being prideful you know you don't have respect for for keith ranieri you're not showing him enough tribute it was constantly like every time i would step forward if they wanted me to step forward if they wanted me to go do a ted talk or whatever that was great but if i wanted to do the ted talk that was that was a problem and so like I was looking at my Instagram feed, it's got, it's got my face everywhere right now. And I look at it and I go like, ooh, that's just <laughs> a little much, you know? And then I look, and then I think, but look at, let's look at some other, other people that are like, you know, these public personalities. And I go, oh, their face is everywhere as well. Like that, maybe they're fine with it. And, and I'm still trying to overcome this feeling of like, ah, maybe I should just do more sunsets, you know, or more of this, or maybe <laughs> just quotes, you know, like, but people are saying to me, please use your face. Yeah. please talk because that's what we want to hear and I'm like oh okay you know so it's been an interesting process of taking up space you bet because it's not yet natural to me it's different on a film set mm. you know if I'm if I'm directing on a film set that's different that I'm I'm accustomed to taking up space so that's the job mm -hmm. but in this in this you know public venue um, I feel like I'm gonna get punished for taking up too much space still you bet well you it's, it's it's the same thing of of waiting for the catch like waiting yeah. for that other shoe to drop yeah. like yes. I, 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 I go ahead go ahead no i was gonna say i i have a similar thing so um you know i was recently encouraged to um it's, you know, the, my the friend i trust very much like like she was saying you know look your social media accounts are, you know, they're your words and that's, that's mm. great. That's what people come for. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but a big part of kind of what makes you, you is the fact that, that it's all part of your story and your journey. So, I mean, maybe mm -hmm. it would kind of, it would be helpful for people to see your face. And so, mm -hmm. so I've, I've started trying, I imagine like mm -hmm. your process and my process is probably very similar in this respect. Like, like mm -hmm. I've started trying like, well, okay, maybe I'll post a selfie, Mm -hmm. every day or two right like just it doesn't have to mm -hmm. be anything profound but every time i put my face out there mm -hmm. i feel like oh i'm asking mm -hmm. for somebody's bandwidth and attention for my stupid face mm. and i'm not even offering anything like i'm i'm, I'm more comfortable posting my cat because i feel well that at least offers something that at least offers mm -hmm. like a cute little you know, like a, like a moment mm. of, of pleasure in your day as opposed to mm. my stupid face. But what I get when I do post my face are people saying, thank you for this. Thank you for, you know, connecting this to a human experience because there are plenty yes. of places we can go for words and I mean, come here for your specific words. Mm -hmm. But the fact that you're in it with us and you always speak mm. in terms of we is, is yes. really, really meaningful. But I'm still waiting for, like you, I'm still waiting for that catch, like some somebody to be like, oh God, this guy, this guy. Yeah. He, he only wants to post his face. What are you doing? Yeah, and, and the thing, I, also like social media is a rough place. And, and I have found myself, uh, you know, when, when the vow came out, I was, people came after me, you know. I, know, I became I know, a symbol of something yeah. to them. And yeah. they were mean. Um, and I had, you know, multiple meltdowns and I stopped using social media for a while. So even to this day, like I'll post things sometimes and then there'll always be somebody, 
you know, who just like comes after me for stuff. And it, and it's, it's that feeling of like, Oh, there's the punishment. Yeah. There it is. And then to have to, to want to, not to have to, but to want to keep pushing and, and, and trying I have to sometimes say to myself, okay, Mark, you understand projection. You understand the hell they live in. You understand that you are a, a piece of their story. Yeah. that they are projecting out in the world. You understand that? I go, yeah, I understand that. It still feels bad. I go, that's okay. It feels bad. You, got- you know, I'm not pretending anymore that it, that it, that it doesn't, you know? Yeah. But yeah, I, I, you know, your account has been so, so healing. And I love your, I love your selfies. I love <laughs> when you posted the meditation one, I was like, huh, interesting. He meditates. Oh, that's kind of mm-hmm. cool. <laughs> and so, Part of the reason I wanted to talk to you as well is because your wisdom is extraordinary. And the last time you and I spoke, you know, when the vow season one was coming out, it was just me blabbering most of the time. <laughs> um, and to, to just have a, a conversation with you and just get an understanding, because I was interested in like, who are you that you have this wisdom? What's happened to you? Yeah. You know, you're still here. So you've overcome a bunch of things. And I, th- and I find that very interesting. So, so I'm very grateful that you, you do what you do. It's been extraordinarily helpful to me. Bonnie also loves, loves your stuff. Mm. She was excited that I was going to talk to you today because she said, I love his stuff. It's, it's amazing. Um, so just tell, tell us, how do people find you on social media? What are the different handles and things that they will find you? You bet. My, uh, I, first of all, thank you so much for... for your 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 very kind words of 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 affirmation so it it really makes a difference um you know to be able to you know come face to face with somebody who has who's found meaning in in things that i've that i've written i i'm always i'm I'm at this kind of interesting place in my career Mm -hmm. or because yeah you know like my my work has been accessible to a lot of people i've been very fortunate as far as that that's taken place but anymore like anybody who comes to work with me is is usually very familiar with with my work mm-hmm. and it's so interesting to kind of have my own words kind of quoted to me like when i yeah do when i do an intake like one of my big questions is like so what if what's moved the needle for you if anything in the world mm-hmm. like 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 mm-hmm. what has kept you alive and to have people say yeah this thing that you wrote sometimes even years mm-hmm. ago it was, was really, really mm-hmm. meaningful. It's, it's, I, I can't describe the role that plays in, in my continuing motivation to, to do this. Like, like now, like previously it was all anger and now it's maybe, now it's maybe 50, 50, like I'm still very angry mm-hmm. and I still, mm-hmm. I still allow that to fuel me. But, um, mm-hmm. also having the, the actual experience of real people saying that it's meaningful to them. Um, that's so beautiful. meaningful to me. So thank you so much for putting words to that. Um, hmm. You can find me uh, on all of the things. I'm Dr. Doyle says, D-R-D-O-Y-L-E-S-A-Y-S. Dr. Doyle says on, on Twitter and threads and Instagram. Um, you know, I also, uh, uh, a lot of my work is shared on the Seek Safely um, social media channels on, on Instagram and threads and, and Twitter. Um, and of course, uh, Gene Brown and I do the Seek Safely podcast where... That's right. You know, we, we talk about... You know, Ginny Brown for years has been very clear about the fact that, look, it was never our intent to start a watchdog org. So it's never going to... We're never going to be the people you come to and ask, is, is this guy a cult or is mm-hmm. this philosophy exploitative? Mm-hmm. What we want to do is make resources available for you to think about this stuff and kind of make your own call about that. And that's really what Gene and I talk about. We talk about, you know, I'm a great big self-help dork for, from years. Like I, I love, in addition to just loving the literature, I love the history of the movement and whatever. So we get into a lot of that on the podcast, kind of the history and the context of the self-help movement. In yeah. addition to talking about various teachers and, and again, we never kind of come down and saying, well, this is bad. Like we recently yeah. had a whole episode about Teal Swan and kind of the mm-hmm. culture surrounding the way trauma is, is talked about and mm-hmm. the self-help movement. But uh, yeah, we try to make it uh, thought provoking as opposed to prescriptive. So that's on the that. Seek Safely podcast. But, um, Seek yeah. Safely podcast. And what is the Seek Safely website? That is seeksafely.org. 
you go and you, you find, find our red flags and find content about our, our, our compass tool. You'll also find a lot of really interesting uh, interviews. Like you'll find a, a, an, an interview with me where I kind of talk about my story. In fact, on one of the episodes of the Seek Safely Pod, like I, I go into, into detail about kind of this journey that you and I kind of brushed on. Yeah, yeah. The, the kind of what, uh, what that is like. You know, I often say that we as psychology, like speaking as a psychologist now, like, like we as psychology have always had this antagonistic relationship with self-help. Um, mm. You know, patients will come into our office and say, yeah, I was reading the self-help book and we'll just kind of roll our eyes like, oh, good. Mm. Now I have to unfuck their head about this. <laughs> But I think that antagonistic relationship has not served the field of psychotherapy well, um, specifically mm. because the vast majority of folks who are seeking help go to self-help first. Right. Like, like we as a, as, as a culture have not made mental health care terribly affordable or accessible. Yeah. So we, you know, we bear some of that responsibility for the self-help industry having become what it has. So yeah. I'm a big fan of... of therapists being really familiar with the industry and the personalities and the ideologies in the industry. So. I love that. I love that. Dr. Doyle, thank you so much for your time. It's been a great conversation. I it really is an honor. It. it is a pleasure. It's so great to connect with you again. I was looking forward to it.